the same face, the very same. Marley in his pigtail, the usual pace coat, tight boots, the tassels on the ladder bristling like his pigtail, and his coat skirts and the hair upon his head. The chain he drew was clasped about his metal. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made, Scrooge observed it closely, of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent, so the Scrooge, observing him and looking through his waistcoat, could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Scrooge had often heard it said that Marley had no bowels, but he had never believed it until now. No, nor did he believe it even now, though he looked through the phantom through and through and saw it standing before him, though he felt the chilling influence of its deaf, cold eyes and marked the very texture of the folded kerchief bound about its head and chin, which wrapper he had not observed before. He was still incredulous and fought against his senses. "'How now?' said Scrooge, caustic and cold as ever. "'What do you want with me?' "'Much!' Marley's voice, no doubt about it. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you, then? said Scrooge, raising his voice. Your particular for a shade. He's going to say to a shade, but substituted this has more appropriate. In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you, can you sit down? asked Scrooge, looking doubtfully at him. I can. Do it, then. Scrooge asked the question because he didn't know whether a ghost so transparent might find himself in a condition to take a chair. He felt that in the event of its being impossible, it might involve the necessity of an embarrassing explanation. But the ghost sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace as if he were quite used to it. "'You don't believe in me,' observed the ghost. "'I don't,' said Scrooge. "'What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses?' "'I don't know,' said Scrooge. "'Why do you doubt your senses?' "'Because,' said Scrooge, "'a little thing affects them. "'A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. "'You may be an undigested bit of beef, "'a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, "'a fragment of an underdone potato. "'There's more of gravy than the grave about you, "'whatever you are.' "'Scrooge was not much in the habit of cracking jokes, "'nor did he feel in his heart by any means waggish then.' The truth is that he tried to be smart as a means of distracting his own attention and keeping down his terror, for the spectre's voice disturbed the very marrow in his bones. To sit staring at those fixed glazed eyes in silence for a moment would play, Scrooge felt very deuce with him. There was something very awful, too, in the spectre's being provided with an infernal atmosphere of its own. Scrooge could not feel it himself, but this was clearly the case. For though the ghost sat perfectly motionless, its hair and skirts and tassels were still agitated by the hot vapor from an oven. "'You see this toothpick?' said Scrooge, returning quickly to the charge for the reason just assigned, and wishing that it were only for a second to divert the vision's stony gaze from himself. "'I do,' replied the ghost. "'You are not looking at it,' said Scrooge. "'But I see it,' said the ghost, notwithstanding. "'Well,' returned Scrooge, I have but to swallow this, and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins, all of my own creation. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug! At this the spirit raised a frightful cry, and shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from being fallen in a swoon. How much greater was his horror than the phantom taking off the bandage round its head, as if it were too warm to wear indoors. Slower jaw dropped down upon its breast. Scrooge fell on his knees and clasped his hands before its face. Mercy, he said. Dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, replied the ghost. Do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge. I must. Why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men, and travel far and wide, and if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. 
It is doomed to wander through the world, how oh, woe is me, and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth, and turn to happiness. Again the spectre raised a cry and shook its chain and wrung its shadowy hands. You are fettered, said Scrooge, trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on of my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is it bad and strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. Or would you know, pursued the ghost, the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was full and heavy as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have laboured on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor in expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty or sixty fathoms of iron cable, but he could see nothing. Jacob, he said imploringly, Old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. Nor can I tell you what I would. A very little more is all permitted to me. I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Oh, mark me! And in life my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me. It was a habit with Scrooge, whenever he became thoughtful, to put his hands in his breeches' pockets. Pondering what the ghost had said, he did so now, but without lifting up his eyes or getting off his knees. You must have been very slow about it, Jacob, Scrooge observed, in a business-like manner, but with humility and deference. Slow! The ghost repeated. Seven years dead, mused Scrooge, and travelling all the time. The whole time, said the ghost, no rest, no peace, incessant torture of remorse. You travel fast, said Scrooge. On the wings of the wind, replied the ghost. You might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years, said Scrooge. The ghost, on hearing this, set up another cry, and clanked his chain so hideously in the dead silence of that night, that the ward would have been justified in indicting it for a nuisance. "'Oh, captive bound and double-ironed!' cried the phantom. "'Not to know that ages of incessant labour by immortal creatures, for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is all developed.' Not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it might be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life or opportunity misused. Yet such was I. Oh, such was I. But you're always a good man of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply them to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. It held up its chain and arm's length, as if that were the cause of all its unveiling grief, and flung it heavenly upon the ground again. At this time of the rolling year, the spectre said, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down, and never raise them to the blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted me? Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the spectre going on at this rate, and began to quake exceedingly. Hear me, cried the ghost. My time is nearly gone. I will, said Scrooge, but don't be hard on me. Don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray. How is it that I appear before you in a shape that you can see? I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. It was not an agreeable idea. Scrooge shivered and wiped the perspiration from his brow. It is no light part of my penance, pursued the ghost. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring, Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me, 
said Scrooge. Thank you. You will be haunted, resumed the ghost, by three spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell almost as low as the ghost had done. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? he demanded in a faltering voice. It is. I, I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Without the visit, said the ghost, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? hinted Scrooge. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third upon the next night and the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that for your own sake you remember what has passed between us. When it had said these words, the spectre took its wrapper from the table and bound it round its head as before. Scrooge knew this by the smart sound its teeth made. The jaws were brought together by the bandage. He ventured to raise his eyes again and found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude with his chain wound over and about its arm. The apparition walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did. When they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up his hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped. Not so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, for on the raising of the hand he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation and regret, wailings inexpressibly sorrowful and self-accusatory. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined the mournful dirge and floated out into the bleak dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. He looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste, and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He'd been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant, whom it saw below on a doorstep. The misery with them all was, clearly, that they sought to interfere for good in human matters, and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faded into the mist, or mists enshrouded them, he could not tell, but they and their spirit voices faded together. The night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say, Humbug! but stopped at the very first syllable, and being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour, much in need of repose, went straight to bed without undressing, and fell asleep upon the instant.